Yes. This is the only time we have, so let's make the most of it. We are delighted to introduce to all our chief guest, Mr. Shehnaz Fakir, director and treasurer of the Orbis Schools, and our guest of honor, Mr. Aman Rajab Ali, president of National HRD Pune. Mr. Shehnaz Fakir is a postgraduate in environmental sciences and has worked as a lecturer in various institutes. She has recently updated her skill set with a bachelor's in education with an intention of acquiring knowledge and adding value to the function of education and at various levels. Committed to taking education beyond textbooks is what ma'am has as her objective for now and for the future. We welcome you, ma'am. Nish Kaam Karmiyog and Zindagi Zindadili Ka Naam Hem is Mr. Aman Rajab Ali's motto in life. Let's give a warm welcome to our guest of honor, Mr. Aman Rajab Ali, who comes with an extensive experience in varied areas of human resource management and consulting. We welcome you, sir, with a green presentation. Around the world, across countries, in schools, institutions, theaters, amongst varied communities, people gather every day at TEDx events to share ideas, spark conversations, and create connections. Ideas bubbling with newness and word spreading. We at the Orbis School, Keshav Nagar, feel proud yet humbled today as we host TEDx Orbis School and be a part of a global conversation. Our theme, can the future really influence the past, holds much food for thought. Can you get a stomach ache today thanks to tomorrow's bad lunch? Of course not. The question doesn't make sense. Or does it? Cause always precedes effect, or we thought so. But maybe life isn't quite so straightforward. This idea that the future can influence the present, the present can influence the past, or that the past, present, and future coexist has been around for quite a while, and for good reason, because we never see effects happen before their causes in everyday life. Or is it so? Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, 
In theatres, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. This evening, we have a set of seven speakers covering a wide range of perceptions on the theme to foster learning, inspiration, and wonder, and provoke conversations that matter. On this wonderful note, we call upon our first speaker, Ms. Sunanda Bicha Mehta, an eminent journalist and author. Ms. Sunanda is the former resident editor of the Indian Express Pune. Good evening, everyone. So can the future really change the past? <clears throat> can we alter something when the die has been cast? <clears throat> I remember those young days just after my graduation. My parents made me choose teaching over journalism as my vocation. I knew my heart lay in writing. So after just two years, to be precise, I moved to journalism, but never let my parents forget their misguided advice. Some years later, I was asked to be the visiting faculty in journalism in the university. What held me in good stead, you guessed it, was my long forgotten BA degree. My future had changed my perceptions of my past, and my poor parents were finally let off the hook at last. Scores of stories in the years ahead showed me without a doubt how future choices healed hurts of past through bitterness out. From the girl who lived with hatred for the killers of her parents, and then one day, she forgave them from her heart and in the process expunged all the turmoil away. On the flip side was this privileged man who thought he was the world's luckiest lad, till a DNA test proved his genes came not from the man he called dad. And then the deflation of my own ego, born from the position of some decrease, that today have been completely overshadowed by this invention we call chat. In 30 seconds, it throws up answers that would take me at least one hour. The certificates I was so proud of have lost some of the sheen and some of their power. So the future may not be able to change the past events that have already taken place, but it can alter perceptions and throw up new discoveries that you must face. Generally speaking though, who wouldn't want to go back and change some things? Some bad choices, unsung judgments, faulty decisions, and incorrect instincts. But the law of life prohibits this travel back to time and for valid reasons. What if you went back and committed some grave treasons? Like murdering your grandfather somehow when you were still in school. He then wouldn't have met your granny, you got your dad, and you would be here, a bit uncool. Quantum physics, though, has delved deeper into this and actually proved it can be done. 
done. They don't need a huge control back in time, but yes, atoms and photons. John Wheeler showed this with the duality of matter and light in his delayed choice experiments. How a particle could behave as a wave for a particle depending upon later measuring instruments. Too complex, isn't it? Yes, indeed. In fact, it makes me think it might be better to carefully think out decisions than trying to rectify them in hindsight. But seriously speaking, of all the times to debate this subject, today is the most pertinent because we are actually living through this kind of change the past intent. Today this question is not as hypothetical as it was yesterday. So am I saying that the past can be changed in a way? Well, the past is history, and history today is being rewritten, surely. Some dynasties, some Darwinian, Darwinian concepts have exited textbooks quietly. We have changed names of roads and cities. We have banned tons of books and ditties. World over, politically incorrect phrases are being removed or revised. Lest the post sounds offensive or the writer is criticized. As a small writer myself, there's something I'd like to add to this particular discussion. Put into it some reason, some rhyme, and debate it with passion. I mean, who can possibly call P.G. Woodhouse an offensive writer? A man who's not used phrases stronger than a blighter. I'm Fleming's new James Bond may be less racist and more polite. But what something about those pages make you feel they don't sound all right? And while Roald Dahl could have avoided Karen calling kids ugly and fat, that's a consensus. But erasing those adjectives is tampering with precious original work of a genius. By omitting words like oriental, gypsy, native, from books of Agatha Christie, are we not disregarding contexts that shape narratives in all worlds literally? Those who have the wisdom and ability to read all these legends so great would surely also have the wisdom to realize that no offense was intended in the first place. Incidentally, I have just finished translating my great-grandfather's book of humorous poetry. And now I understand why rhyming comes to me so naturally. It's clear some gene has traveled so far down somehow, making it easier for me to write verses than prose, if you haven't guessed that by now. Again, hundred years ago, we may have never imagined this happening. That is, Punjabi poetry would be respected from the past and changed for an English-speaking gathering. But the point here, what I really want to make, in fact, is that I have kept the language, his vices, even his biting satire intact. And while no other contribution to the literary world is minuscule by any rate, but decades later, if anyone would want to change my book's lines, I would feel betrayed. Multiply that by a thousand times for icons like Fleming, Woodhouse, Darwin, Dahl, and Christie. And you will know it's not correct to edit works of legend, especially posthumously. So at this point, I would like to twist the theme of the day a wee bit. We know now that future can influence the past, but should it? Or should the past remain undisturbed and left alone? past remain undisturbed and left alone, surely there should be some sins for which we could atone. The crux to it all maybe lies in sensitivity and ethics. One must be able to judge what should and what should not be fixed. 
if your own future is likely to become more peaceful and more calm, go right ahead and influence the events of the years gone by if they are right about. The years which are gone can happily make you live present in a better way. But pause deeply and think before the same principle you apply to others who are not there. Mankind will continue to find ways to influence even in the past. It is on our DNA to do the exact opposite of what nature in stone has cast. Remember the Garden of Eden? With that one instru instruction Adam got from the Almighty, do whatever you want, kid, just don't eat that apple, I beseech thee. The minute he turned his back, well, that's precisely what our man just had to do. The result? Here are all of us today in this world discussing past, present, and the future. Thank you. character named Hodor say the entire time was his own name Hodor without ever knowing why. Uh, but then we discover that when one of the characters Bran traveled back in time and needed to be saved, he seized control of a young Hodor's mind and asked him to hold the door. Hold the door, hold the door, Hodor. By seizing control of Hodor's mind in the present just before his death, Bran messed up Hoder's mind decades in the past, or to save Bran in the future, Hoder's entire past became monosyllabic. A fascinating and intriguing spiel, isn't it? The idea that Hoder's future was responsible for his past is quite compelling and entertaining, but also complete fiction. So what, literature has the liberty to play with the past, present, and future, or rather time, the way it plays with goblins, jinns, and unicorns. But do we have the same liberty given to us in the real world? I think we can explore this a bit further. On the basis of our current limited knowledge of time and space, and our limited ability to manipulate either, I think that the idea that the future can influence the past is as elusive as the equally appealing idea of time travel. The concept of retrocausality has often been used as an explanation and proof of this statement. But I don't think that's such a shaky science, which a majority of scientists regard as a pseudoscience, sorry, pseudoscience, can be taken as definitive evidence. Not only is the information about retrocausality minimal and confusing, but also nothing can be said for sure about it yet, as it's such a young science. So let's take away the scientific limits of such a theory and approach it through the eyes of the beings who experience these past, presents, and futures. Let's look at it through a human lens. Spirituality is an accumulation of humankind's beliefs and faiths and is one of the most competent ways to judge how we perceive time. In Buddhist philosophy, for example, um, Buddhists don't consider time as something that exists. Buddhists, with the emphasis on meditation, have long regarded time as an unspooling of the mind. They don't believe in anything permanent. And in fact, in Zen mind, beginner's mind, 
Shunryu Suzuki tells us, you may say, I must do something this afternoon, but actually, there is no this afternoon. At one o'clock, you will eat your lunch. To eat your lunch is itself one o'clock. Early Buddhist philosophy presented an empiristic and relativistic conception of time, meaning that time is based on what one experiences, while the Madhyamika's philosophy denied the existence of time altogether. Basically, the Buddhist belief is that the only time that matters is now, that is, the present. They don't believe in a past or a future or often in the existence of time. All moments are but fleeting, and it is in these fleeting moments in which one lives. They consider the present time period the only thing we can influence. So at this point, I feel obligated to tell you that I, shockingly, don't think that the future can influence the past. But then I think a majority of you would tend to share my opinion on this. And if that's the case, why are we still asking ourselves this question? And while obviously it's due to all the recent developments and questions raised in quantum theory and physics, I think this question has been around for a while. The concept of karma has often been used as evidence of the statement in the sense that based on what we think our future will hold, we tend to change our actions now. Because technically you could consider the present, the past of the future. But then again, isn't that true for basically anything? If I'm studying today, it's with the intention that because I hadn't studied all month, I need to start studying today in order to pass my exam. And this is more of a hindsight bias, like one, when one claims to have predicted an event before it occurred. And I would just like to point out that there's a significant distinction between the future influencing the past directly versus the future influencing one's perspective of the past. Similarly, people often use predictions as a way to justify this statement, in the sense that how business companies often change and formulate their policies based on future economic market predictions. And yeah, to a certain extent, that might be true. But we can never predict the future accurately. Just look at the case of COVID-19. Who could have seen that coming? So based on all of this, I feel quite confident when I say that I don't think the future can influence the past. And I've already explained to spirituality now why I oppose this statement. So let's take a 180 and turn to a rather unconventional but highly reliable source of information, mathematics. And it does pain me that mathematics is actually useful in my life. Anyways, in mathematics, the concept of time is explored quite uniquely. And in fact, algebra has been called the science of pure time. In time, a dual of space, Schopenhauer has presented his space and time dualism. To paraphrase his words, he stated that time has three distinct divisions, the past, present, and future. Time has no permanence, but passes the moment it is present. And time is not simultaneous, but successive. Essentially, Schopenhauer has highlighted how time is distinctly divided and occurs not all at once, but in a flow, moving from the past to the present and to the future. His belief of time having no permanence further supports the notion that it is only the present that matters. The past is done and the future is undetermined, but the present is the one thing we can change, and once it passes, it's done as well. Similarly, these three distinct divisions follow a strict pattern of existence, and this pattern in turn helps in the existence of mathematics. So even in mathematics, we can easily infer that it is only the present that matters. Now I dropped maths in grade 11 for a reason. So we shall also drop this topic and head on over and view the discussion through another enthralling viewpoint, mythology, specifically Greek mythology. Now for any of you who have ever read or studied mythology or even Percy Jackson for that matter, you would be aware of the three fates in Greek mythology. The three fates are portrayed as three old spinsters weaving the thread of life between them. And often, one or all of them are seen writing in the book of fate. They have in, these three fates have in hand the destiny of an individual, and as they wish, they cut it short. These three goddesses distribute an allotment of misery and suffering among the individuals, but mainly they determine their lifespan, their destiny, and all the events that will occur in it. 
So essentially, the three fates act as confirmation of the idea of a pre-established destiny of an individual. Nothing a person says or acts like can change his future, his fate. Why, even the king of all gods, Zeus, is powerless in front of them. During the Trojan War, he's aware that his beloved son Sarpedon will die at the hands of Patroclus. Yet, he doesn't wield any power to save him, or rather, change his fate. Similarly, between the, before the duel between Hector and Achilles, Zeus weighs the destinies on a golden scale and learns the outcome. However, he could only learn their outcome as opposed to having any influence or control over it. So no matter which viewpoint you look at this multifaceted concept of time from, through a mythological lens, through a spiritualistic lens, or through a mathematical lens, we come to a simple conclusion. The present is the only thing we can influence and the only thing we have the power to change. The past and future are not relevant in this moment, the present moment. This is the only time that matters and life can only take place in the present moment. If we lose the present moment, we lose life. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. It is our privilege and pleasure to introduce Dr. Apoor Shimpi, Principal and Professor, Sancheti College of Physiotherapy, Pune, and Chairperson of the Indian Association of Physiotherapists Research Committee, West Zone, as our next speaker. Namaste. What a beautiful time to discuss on a concept which is challenging the existence of time itself. And is this concept really relevant in healthcare? Let us look at this. What exactly is health all about? Well, the World Health Organization defines health, sorry for that, yeah. The World Health Organization defines health as a concept of physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely an absence of disease or infirmity. So when we talk of health, we are again talking of physical dimension and mental dimension. So there is a time or a dimension even to health. Can I have the next slide, please? OK, no issues with it. So when we are talking of the concept of uh, health or uh, well-being, next please. As I said earlier, that this is an abstract concept and we are talking of its existence in the era today. Next please. Next please. So health, as I said earlier, has a dimension of time. But can there be an influence of the future on the past in healthcare domain? Next please. So there is a good amount of research or literature that has been done on effect of smoking on lung cancer. We all know today that if you are involved in smoking, there is a risk of developing lung cancer in the future. Hence, it has been understood that if you change a component or a trigger in the past, especially the concept of smoking, of course, you will not be at a risk of getting lung cancer. Isn't it straightforward? Next, please. Similarly, we have the concept of getting cardiovascular risk factors and lifestyle domains. If you are at a risk of getting some cardiac domains, which we'll talk about, for example, obesity, diabetes, or any other healthcare domain, you are at a risk of getting a cardiac surgery or cardiac problem in the future. Hence, if you know that you are at certain risk factors, can it be possible to change this and prevent you from getting the cardiac problem in the future. Now for the sake of argument, you will say, okay, fine, you are talking of you know, things that have done in the future and its effect on the past, but it's not the same person. Next, please. So I would like you to talk about two examples that I'm talking of. I have two patients, Mr. Khan and Mr. Sharma. Both of them are around in their mid-30s, sedentary, recent diabetic. They have a raised blood cholesterol level 
they are grade one obese, uh, so their tummy looks kind of just like mine, and they are foodie. We all know, as Indians, we have our entire domain of hospitality on food. You know, if someone comes home and they, they, they do not eat, it's like, whoa. So what happened to both of them? Next, please. When they took up the session of exercise, physiotherapy, lifestyle modifications, they were counseled for a lot of domains of uh, fitness. Next, please. Now, Mr. Khan, he showed a good amount of commitment. He did his regular exercise, his fitness domain, his exercise involvement, and then he actually, you know, showed some commitment to it. Whereas Mr. Sharma, he, you know, took it for maybe two weeks and just got busy. You know, like all of us have no time, we are busy. He was the same like most of us. Next, please. So how exactly did future influence their past? Next, please. So Harold Timberley explains that our future also has a future and our past also has a past. Means my tomorrow also has another tomorrow and my yesterday has another yesterday. But the difference is my past is only one. Means my yesterday was only one which I have already lived through. It's a fixed fact. But my future are many. It depends on what choice, what things I do, whether I take the left or I take the right, that will depend on what my future direction is going to be. Next, please. So in the case of my two very dear friends, Mr. Khan, he took a long-standing commitment to lifestyle and fitness, did his exercise, uh, routine, lifestyle modifications, gave up on all those yummy foods and all, and that's how he became. Whereas for Mr. Sharma, he, ha he showed a poor commitment, not really inclined towards his health, fitness and other domains and had to undergo a surgery very soon enough because all the restraints or restrictions on them. Next, please. So both of them made a choice for their future behavior which influenced their past but exactly in the opposite direction. So friends, what choice you make for your health condition, the, the critical choice is very crucial for associating the lifestyle condition for the effect of future on your past because it kind of becomes a chain of events. Well, as I said, it has a physical dimension and a mental dimension. So let's look at the second time phase. I want to talk of another client of mine, Mrs. Shah, who was a, in mid-40s, a typical orthodox family, uh, a homemaker, mother of two children, she was suffering from back pain since the past eight months. She showed it to almost a lot of physiotherapists, a lot of doctors, and had a very poor response, and finally came to me, and I'm kind of known, you know, a bit famous for getting treatment of chronic disease or conditions, so I I'm just kidding. I, I think it's okay to have a bit of boasting around a bit in this wonderful audience. Well, her X-ray and MRI kind of showed a very good picture, a not very, very th something which is very offensive. We all get scared when we look and the doctor shows you an MRI, like, whoa, what is wrong with it? Trust me, most of us have a very similar picture. When we probed into her issues, we went back into time to understand what her concerns and problems were, and we found out that she was into an arranged marriage, so friends, you can guess you know, her concerns or issues. She had to shift from Ahmedabad to Pune. She was working, she was you know, getting her education. She had to shift her entire life she, and during the course of the wedding, there was some sarcastic comments that were made from her mother-in-law, you know, and it was here somewhere that they were filled into. And eight months back, her mother-in-law had come to her for staying, and something, something triggered her issues, something triggered her pain or her problem. Next, please. So what is this all about? You, you will be hearing a lot on quantum physics and retrocausality where you all will be hearing about how the effect precedes the cause. In healthcare domain, I would like to introduce a term, retro-casualty. We have heard about casualty. Our hospital has a wonderful casualty department where we have a lot of accidents and traumas coming in. So retro is past and casualties are the accidents and traumas that we have. And there it affects the physical and psychological aspects of health. And friends, we are carrying these traumas with us every single day. Anxiety, failures, guilt, wrongs, a lot of factors that are carried with us quite a lot of times. 
and we carry with us emotional baggage or burden like ego jealousy hatred failures you know these will keep on pondering over your mind in case of mrs shah she had to undergo rigorous counseling and physical therapy to actually go back in her past and forgive her mother in law for her actions to make peace with her present so you will see time is a relative term in healthcare where you can actually travel back and front to take care of your issues in clinical domains we call these as psychosomatic disorders you must have heard of the famous sayya psycho what is psycho all about psycho when we feel we say they are mental problems they are problems of the mind in the clinical presentations 70% of us show these problems and friends they are all real they are not a game of the mind they actually exist in form of a lot of issues like back pain neck pain headaches or other psychosomatic disorders like myofascial dysfunctions uh, it's okay if you don't understand that's where i am there for next please so i have a simple rule for all of us that is the 33% rule of a happy life 33% of our life we are spending in work 33% in sleep i hope so because that is equally important but when we are working when we are involving with people or so we try to please everybody and it's okay you cannot make everybody happy all the time it's fine forgive yourself just be kind to yourself because the 33% that is very important is to live your life and we forget that we forget that important 33% of our concept next please so friends it's okay don't waste your precious time in collecting these burdens and these baggages all throughout it's okay to forgive and forget very important is to forgive others but more important is if you can forgive your own self so ultimate truth as steven covey says if you are attending your own funeral try and imagine what people around you might be saying there must be saying good things about you but not everybody will talk good thing about you so can you go back in time and make those amendments make those changes so that people actually start doing good for you because friends when we die in the future i mean it can be after a year it can be after a month it can be tomorrow we are going to change the moment in our past and that is the moment when we have got our life when we came into existence in this world so finally invest in your future to go back in the time and exercise the forgive and forget which is very very important to take care of your health your physical time dimension of health your mental dimension of health rather your future to your past so don't let the shadows of your past darken your future just forgive and let go thank you so much for your kind attention thank you sir time is a relative thing different for you different for me changing from far off future to slowly moving present to where did it all go past time does not care who makes it through the lamps it does not bother with living up to plans it simply forces us all to play by its hands like the hands of a clock that tick by rhythm until you forget to notice in your complicated living that the rhythm has faded into time's relativity including you including me all that was future has already come to pass and your life has already gone by in a flash
Assistant Vice President at Burgundy Private Acquisitions with an enterprising career that spans over 15 years in the banking field. Let's welcome Ms. Deepti Sharma, our next speaker. Well, my tribe and my young adult squad, a very good evening to one and all. Before we start, let me throw some really exotic and fancy words at you. Deja vu, multiverse, parallel universe, black hole, wormhole, cyborg, teleportation. And now, one quixotic statement. Can the future really influence the past? Well. 
this is not sounding like a mainstream statement. We know about the cause and effect, but this is counter, kind of a very counterintuitive statement. Our brain would not be accepting it. It's quite overwhelming for us. There are two reasons for that. Firstly, there are billions and millions of brains wandering on this planet, and there is no absolute truth. There is no gospel truth. Every brain has its own version of truth, its own narrative, its own script, its own values, its own belief system. So whenever a brain comes across any unique or a new proposition like this, it tries to negate it. It calls it counterintuitive, delusional, spooky, eccentric. And there's one more reason why our brain doesn't accept statements like that. There is a constant showdown happening between our evolved brain and our ancient brain. I'll tell you a bit about our ancient brain. Now, what happened in prehistoric times? There were brutal tribal wars happening constantly. There were ferocious animals attacked. There were natural calamities. So this little brain of ours was always on a hyper-vigilant mode, always scanning for breaches. So that, my friends, is the reason of a negative bias. So today, persuade your mind, increase your appetite to explore the whole world of possibilities around this wonderful theme. Today, we'll have a hybrid approach. We'll talk a bit about physics and a little more about finance because this is the world from where I come from. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this dapper, delectable, absolute creator of fiction, I'm sure this is a movie which is immortalized. When I watched this movie, I had goosebumps. So there's a, there's a specific scene in this movie which gives me heebies jeebies and creeps me out, is when Neo, he asks a kid who is like a monk, and when he asks him, how did you turn this spoon? So the monk says, I did not turn my spoon, I turned my intellect. Well, I just wanted to give you a flavor of what's in for us. Next slide, please. Well, a very interesting question to my entire young adult squad, my BTS army. If you had $1,000, what would you do? You'd buy their merchandise. I can see a few smiles. Would you buy their merchandise? Would you buy the tickets for their concert? Well, sorry to disappoint, but this is for some other day. This was just for your attention. Next slide, please. Okay. Now we'll discuss that if we have $1,000, how we can relate it to space and time and how we can actually get the benefit of future influencing the past and make money out of it. So the first concept, well, we everybody knows about time. Time is linear, infinite, symmetrical, unidirectional. But in the Einstein universe, space and time are interwoven together. They are coagulated together. So we bankers, we have taken an advantage of that. And we have introduced, in the world of finance, a pricing discrepancy across the ecosystem concept, which is called as an arbitrage. Now, I'll tell you how in this scenario, future is affecting the past. Now, for example, there is a stock of a phone company which is trading on New York Stock Exchange at $1.25, and the same stock at the same time and different time zone is trading at $1.25.50. As an arbiter, I'll buy it on New York Stock Exchange and I'll sell it off here, making a profit. Now, this profit is absolutely a time precipitant. If you extrapolate time, the price of that asset or that ad exchange is influencing the price of that asset in another exchange, which is in the past. Uh, let me tell you in short how this technology works. I'm sure young minds would be wondering how blockchain works because everything all the transactions happening is happening in the form of fintech. Now, whenever a transaction is initiated, it forms, you know, it is unified in the form of blocks. Each block has its own timestamp data and the data of the previous block. So when the final transaction happens, the final effect is already influencing the past because it's carrying the timestamp data. This is a concrete proof of how future is influencing the past. There are various types of arbitrages, like a space arbitrage, which is completely dependent on geographies. Say, for example, I'm in China, I buy something and I sell it, or maybe I export it to US and I put it on Amazon, I make money out of it by selling it with a markup rate. That is an example of a space coagulant arbitrage. The third one, if you have $1,000, how you're taking advantage of a time and a space continuum would be, if I have $1,000, I'll convert it 
to whatever exchange is the best possible at that particular moment, take do dollars to euro, euro to pound, and again to dollar. So now do you see how the final conglomerate is impacting the past dollar exchange rate? Another very interesting concept is indexation. I'll try to explain it in a very basic language. For example, if you buy a property in Pune worth one crore, now due to inflation, its price will go down over the years. So what concept the, uh, the government has introduced that there is a cost of inflation index. When you multiply it with your asset, you are actually influencing the price of your asset in past while you're calculating today. This is one more example of an arbitrage. Next slide, please. Well, this is a very interesting concept which is called as Ulysses Pact. Okay, so before we move to how again in future which is getting impacted, so this is like a time travel. I'm having a conversation with my future self. For a future freedom, I've been giving up my past freedom. So uh, this Ulysses was a Greek king. While he, was, he won Trojan War and he was sailing, he saw sirens. Now these were these stunning exotic creatures, half women and half birds, who sang beautifully well. And the men were devoid of rational thing and they used to just dump into the rocks and eventually ended up getting killed. So he created a pact with his men that if they arrive, if the sirens arrive, they will tie him to the mast of the ship and they will put wax in the ears. Now this is the kind of disciplined approach that we follow in the world of investments. When I wake up in the morning and immediately I turn off my airphone mode, I'm, I have a volley, I have a barrage of notification. Something happening in US, something happening in crude oil, something happening at indexation, something happening. And it actually lures me to take short term calls. So this is the process in which you build a moat around yourself, you protect yourself across all the noise, and your future is actually getting protected. You are not taking any quick calls just because of this noise. Next slide, please. Uh, time is illusion. Well, uh, I think there's one slide that we have missed, so I'll just take you a brief on that, which is called as quantum entanglement and the global economy. So quantum entanglement is the process in which two objects who are quite distant from each other, but they are impacting each other extensively. Say for example, when I'm talking right now, the particles which are coming out from my sound box, they can actually impact a particle or a photon in a distant star at the edge of infinity. Yes, we have the greatest illusion of separation, my friends, but it actually does not exist. Everything is interconnected. Even when you touch your heart, when your heart is beating, for the blood circulation, there's an iron, which is called as iron. Now, how is iron formed? It is formed by the collision of supernova stars. That is the only way iron is formed. Now you understand how everything is just interconnected and time is just an illusion. So I just want to relate it to the global economy that on every day there are economies, trading, buying, selling, goods, services, ideas, thoughts, everything, you know, networking. So in this whole global ecosystem, there are macroeconomic and there are microeconomic factors. At the macro level, there could be a dollar price, a crude oil price, a US yield, a war happening, a natural calamity, a political upheaval happening anywhere across the globe. It definitely impacts our economy. Even a small election in Chhattisgarh or Bihar can impact. So these things are interwoven and interconnected. Now, finally, the conclusion, my conclusory remarks. Um, time is illusion. See, if you see any pictorial representation of the cosmos, it is always spiral. It is always circular. It's always circle. Have you seen something in a straight line? So how do you know that what is the past, what is the future, and what is the present? As easy as it gets to go from past to future, it is absolutely easy to go from future to the past. It is your mindset which needs to be changed. We can call it anything, you know, scientists can call it quantum physics, spiritual people can call it prayer, some people can call it thoughts, some people can call it placebo effect. See, everybody knows it exists, nobody is denying it existence. So with this thought, I leave um, this presentation and thank you so much for a patient hearing. Thank you.
Thank you, ma'am. Our next speaker is a humanities student from our very own Orbis School, Keshav Nagar. A typical coffee addict, cat obsessed, book lover who aspires to be a chef, Ms. Anvesha Mukherjee. Good evening, everyone. So recently, I found myself watching a lot of movies. A little bit about me, I'm in the new batch of class 12, and the academic year had started a few months ago. So initially, when the semester started, I had a bit of free time in my hands. So I did what every other teenager does, binge watch Netflix and Prime. But after a while, it got kind of boring because the movies were so predictable. It was so cliche. The same storyline repeated again and again. Another thing about me is I'm a huge science fiction fan. So one day, my dad and I were talking about movies, and he brought up Steven Spielberg. Now, I had heard of this name, but I was not aware of the movies he had worked on. So my dad mentions this really iconic movie, Back to the Future. Show of hands here, how many of us have watched this movie? Okay, not a lot of us, but I'm sure most of us must have heard of the movie. So what I found really interesting about this was the title was Back to the Future. Not back to the past, not back to the present, but to the future. How does one go back to the future exactly? Since most of us here haven't watched the movie, let me give you a brief synopsis. The movie is about this protagonist, Marty, and his eccentric scientist friend, nicknamed Doc, who turns the famous DeLorean car into a time travel machine that can drive back and forth in time, literally. But the car runs on plutonium, which is obviously something you don't find at your local drugstore. So he steals it from the Libyans, which gets him into a bit of trouble. To save himself, Marty takes the car and he runs away, accidentally driving back in the past in the year 1955, the year when his parents were still in high school. And he gets stuck there because he does not have enough plutonium to come back. While in the year 1955, he unintentionally interrupts the very moment his parents first met, endangering not just his, but his siblings' existence, threatening to create an alternate reality without him in it. Now, this movie, I found it interesting for a lot of reasons. First, it showed us that the conception of time is not as clearly demarcated as English grammar makes it sound. What do I mean by that? This moment, the present, what is happening right now, next slide please. This moment, what is happening right now, is your present. What is going to happen is your future. What has already happened is your past. Now suppose you could go back to your past, then that moment would become your present, and your present would become your future. Vice versa, if you were to go to your future, your that moment would be your present, and your present would be your past. So in the movie, Marty never says, I'm from the present, because when he goes back to the past, that is his present moment. So he says that I'm from the future. So the entire movie is about his quest to go back to the future. Another interesting thing that this movie taught me was considering how loose this conception of time is. Didn't his future influence his past? Interesting concept, isn't it? We see a similar case in the movie Avengers Endgame. Any Marvel fans here? A lot of us? So in case you haven't watched the movie, spoiler alert. So what happens in this movie was Thanos wiped out half of the population in the entire universe with a snap of his fingers. Now, it made the present situation very devastating. And the Avengers knew that if this situation continued on in the future, it would be even more disastrous. 
So they go back in the past and try to rectify the situation and ensure that Thanos does not get his hands on the Infinity Stones. Now you must be thinking that these are science fiction movies. Is this concept still applicable to real life? How many of us have heard the phrase, don't cry over the spilt milk? Why do we say that? Because we believe that the past is the past. It can't be changed. No amount of crying is going to put the milk back in its bottle, is it? But what if I told you that this is not that uncommon of a phenomena, that it is applicable in your day-to-day -day life, that even if you don't have a time travel machine, it is still true. It's actually a day-to-day -day phenomena. As a student of humanities, I can tell you that history and political science is filled with such examples. Let's take our elections for example. We all know how elections work, right? So during an election, what happens is you see all these prominent political heads and politicians come and they have this vision in their head that they want to win the elections. They want to secure more votes, maybe for personal gain, maybe for development. But in order to succeed in this goal, what they tend to do is they take a situation in the past and they influence it in such a way that it makes their agenda look good and it supports their agenda. Now this sounds too big of an example. So let me give you a more detailed one. I'm sure all of us must have read about our history, our freedom from colonialism. So, what happened was, when the East India Company came to India, they came with a vision of an expansionist program and territorial ambitions. They wanted to establish a monopoly over the market, exploit the resources and the people, and of course, rule over another country. Now, in order to ensure their success, they used a multitude of tactics. Divide and conquer was but one of them. Another tactic that they used was they took our very own history and they proved to us that the Western civilization was far more superior, that we were uncivilized and savages and that we were primitive and that subjugation of another country was necessary for our development. And so prominent was this tactic that till date the Indian education system that we follow follows the Western model. A quick GK for you, there's actually nothing Indian about our Indian education system. Then comes into the picture our nationalists and freedom fighters. They used the same tactic, but against them. They had a vision in their head for a free India, one that was governed by its own people and not subjugated by another country. And in order to succeed in their vision, they showed that our history was actually very rich, that we have a rich culture, a rich past, architecture, and origin, which was different, but in no way was it inferior. And they used this to mobilize support for our independence. Now, if you see, both the sides used their future vision to influence the past. They didn't feed us lies exactly, they took the past and they altered it in such a way that it made their agenda, their vision look good. But in this case, the future influences the past because it was actively seeked out to do so. But this can happen unintentionally as well, as is the case with the Harappan civilization. Till date, whatever we know about the Harappan civilization is why our archaeological remains because we haven't been able to decipher the scripts yet. Now, suppose someday in the future, the epigraphists do decipher the script. It could very well alter the very course of history. The past is the past and it cannot be changed. But our future does influence it. In order to go ahead in the future, sometimes we have to take a few steps back. We always have this vision in our head about how we want our future to be, about how we want things to be. But we strategize in the past, keeping this vision in our mind, which constantly influences our strategies and constantly affects it. So we see that the future does influence our past. It's just that we have never really consciously registered it. Thank you.
Thank you, Anvesha. Ms. Freya Havewala is an uh, Ms. Freya Havewala, our next young speaker, is a humanities student from the Bishop School camp with a penchant for elocution, debating, creative writing, and acting. Can the future influence our past? I'm sure, at first, your answer was the same as mine. A hard no. What on earth are you talking about? But after some hard-earned thought and pondering, you will learn that the future does influence the past just as much, arguably, as the past influences the future. Now, I won't just be using examples from our favorite movies to prove this, but real-life, psychological, and historical examples. Next slide, please. Now, psychologically, there have been many cases of the future influencing the past, or at the very least, our perception of it. Um, one example is repressed memories. The theory of repressed memories is essentially this. When a child undergoes a great deal of trauma in their formative years, they tend to either suppress or disassociate from that trauma, pushing it down into their subconscious, never to be remembered for the rest of their adolescence. However, when an adult, that child will eventually have a trigger sprung in their brain. This trigger will cause the memory to rise back to the surface, and immediately, a multitude of explanations for behaviors, reactions to certain stimuli will arise. Another example of this could be the golden child versus the scapegoat. The golden child is the preferred child of the family. We may not know why. Maybe they're the preferred gender. Maybe they do better in school. In some cases, they may have survi survived a life-threatening illness. But for whatever reasons, the golden child is on a pedestal and the scapegoat is on the floor. The golden child is showered with love, affection, care, all of their mistakes and all of the bad things they do are obviously the fault of the scapegoat. The golden child will probably look back on their childhood with love. They had a wonderful childhood. Their parents were loving and kind. But with a lot of therapy and a lot of realizations, they will come to the realization that their happiness and love came at the expense of their siblings. You may be wondering what this has to do with the future influencing the past. It is as simple as this. Things we learn in the future drastically alter our perception of the past. A very, very major occurrence of this happens in history. Now, I'm sure we've all played the board game on the screen. Monopoly, is there anyone here who hasn't played that game as a child? Well, until recently, Monopoly was credited to Charles Darrow, the man on the screen. It wasn't until years and years later that it was discovered that the game was actually invented by Elizabeth Meiji Phillips, and her idea was stolen by Charles. This happened so many times throughout the course of history. White men taking the credit for inventions and discoveries made by women or minorities. Now, for something a little bit more theoretical and scientific. Unsolved mysteries. This is the city of Harappa, a wonderful, thriving civilization. We have no idea what happened to it. To this day, there is no clue as to how Harappa went from a thriving civilization and beautiful cities to these ruins. And for that, I propose time travel. Now, as we've all learned from our favorite movies, using the future to alter the past doesn't always end well. Hence, I've come up with a, a different solution and a different use for time travel. Instead of using it to change our past, use time travel to discover it, to understand all of the mysteries that to this day we do not understand. The Black Dahlia, Jack the Ripper, unsolved cases with ghosts that may never be put to rest. And I know what you're thinking. Right now, scientists have said 
that time travel is impossible. But a thousand years ago, they were saying that about heart transplants or airplanes, and look at us now. Furthermore, our future is constantly influencing our life. Every decision that you and I make is with thoughts of our future. They're intrinsically connected. Every single choice you make, every single thought you have is in regards to the future. Even something as simple as which way should I take to college today? If I go the shorter way, I'll reach there on time. But if I go the longer way, I'll have more time to study for that exam I haven't revised for. But in all seriousness, it's the essence of humanity to live for the hope of it all, to put every single thought and fiber of our beings into our future. Think about it. Have, you, have any of you made a single decision that isn't in regards to your immediate or potentially future? So to conclude, I would like to say that our future and our past can never be separated from each other. They will always be connected and they will always be a part of each other. So yes, the future does influence the past. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Freya. Our next speaker, educator for 23 years, circle facilitator, storyteller, founder at Secret Passes Lessons of Life. Ms. Gitanjali Call is our last speaker for today. Ms. Gitanjali Call. A man landed in the prison for a crime that he did not commit. After several days of waiting for justice, he felt so stuck in the prison. It was at this time that his dear friend sent him a prayer rug. He began praying five times a day. He began noticing the weaving of the rug. As he was bowing and sitting still, bowing and sitting still, he noticed the odd patterns on the rug just at the Qibla, where the head touches the rug. And it was at this time that he noticed the pattern of the lock, the lock of the prison that he was confined in. As he saw closer, he saw that there was a pattern which would help him to unlock, and that was his way to freedom. My dear friends, how many times do you sit to re-examine your life and find those patterns? How many times do you feel stuck in the past? Let me share with you my personal story. It was when I was 19 and I was going through my identity crisis when I landed for a Vipassana course, a 10-day meditation camp. It was my hardest and it was my first. It was too difficult for me to sit in silence. My mind wandered, wandered, and wandered back to times when I felt I wasn't worthy enough, I wasn't good enough, and these thoughts kept surfacing, and I tried hard to come back to the present. I vividly remember my day five. It was 4 a.m. in the morning when I was walking, heading towards the Dhamma Hall, and my body miraculously took a turn, and I found a place to sit. It was at this time that I could see the shadows and the patterns of the night, the deepest and the darkest hour. I took a deep breath, and right in front of me, I saw the first ray of light. I saw the dawn and the rising and the changing of the sky color. In moments, it dawned upon me that I had it all inside me as well. The dust, the shadow, the bones, the flesh, and the meat. Yes, in wholeness, I'm all of that. 
It was a great moment of acceptance, my dear friends. Great moment of acceptance. They say somewhere in the middle of your story, you're able to have this viewpoint and you're able to see the expansiveness of the future. And this expansiveness of the future helps you to redirect your past. And you see the past becomes filtered. It becomes slightly smaller. But it's all propelled by the present. You know, in our lives, many a times, we do stumble upon our destiny periods. Destiny points, I call them. And this was one of my destiny points, where I knew that I had to move on and I had to move ahead. And I had a picture clear at that point of time. I had a dream. It felt like I spoke to myself. I'm going to leave footprints on the sand of time. You know, when this destiny spoke to me, it felt like a prophecy. Just like, uh, you know, many of those mythological tales where you have Lord Krishna's prophecy made much before he was born. Like Harry Potter. Yes, it is that time. But at that moment, when I was in my present self, seeing, breathing, knowing that every breath counts, I knew I could make possible shifts. And every breath that I took from that onwards would be the one which will serve my growth. That was the promise I made that morning, and that changed my life. Yeah, I have gratitude towards my family and my environment that I was born with. I was so fortunate that I was born in a family of storytellers. So my cup was full of stories to offer. And I was so natural with visualizations. You know, our brain is hardwired to remember through stories. Hardwired through images and words. And it is in these images and words that our body naturally starts living in that reality. And it propels you to do those actions. Come on, let's all do this together. I request all of you to just relax your body, relax every part of your body, and sit straight as though you're witnessing something at this moment. You know the Zen Buddhism is to just sit back like this. The position of sitting back like this is witnessing. So you can all just sit back and witness. Close your eyes and imagine that you're sitting near the bank of the river. With your feet dipped in the water, you can hear the sound of the stream trickling, the raging of the river. river, and you feel the freshness of that moment. You can have fragrance of every flower that's blooming at that point of time, every fruit that's on the tree. You feel the butterflies fluttering, the bees buzzing, the majestic mountains protecting you. And it feels so cool. Relax your body and slowly open your eyes. Did you notice? Yeah? It just took some seconds to transport yourself. This way, you can reimagine, reclaim your stories. And make a better version of yourself moment to moment as you start serving your personal growth. That's the promise you keep to yourself. Now this land and this route to transformation will have many triggers, I promise you. And for you to handle those triggers, you'll also have to work towards the process of healing, towards the way you look at perceptions, and you have to look at multiple perspective shifts. Once again, let me give you a visual guide. Now right inside you, imagine that there is a room, a room which is very well kept. There are little notes stuck on the wall. There's a little window that opens towards the flowers blossoming. And this is your special room. You keep attending it to it all the time, and you find your peace right here. 
And inside this room, you have two chairs. You can see them here. And you have a coffee table there as well. And you can invite people into your sacred space only by appointment. Now let's imagine the person you want to invite at this point of time is your mother. And uh, imagine that you're around 35 years of age and your mom is sitting next to you here. And as you both are sipping your coffee, sip by sip, you begin to open your heart. And you begin to tell her the moments of your life, your younger days, when she shut you, when she made you feel rejected, when you didn't feel heard, and she's listening to you intently, quietly, and after you finish all that that you had to speak, she too smiles. She takes a pause. And she says, I wish to tell you, my dear daughter, or my dear son, you know what happened to me at that stage of my life when you were of that age? You know, I had my own limitations. You know, I was battling. You know what I went through? And as you listen to that story, to her side of the story, you begin to empathize. And that, that, my dear friend, changes your story. Come here for a moment, be with me once again. I, I know how are you feeling right now. A perception shift, maybe? Try this, journal your experiences. Feel the processing of your emotions because that's when you can move your narrative, the moment you move somewhere inside you. And let me explain, your brain is very quick to connect through these images. Your brain works with you. Through my organization, The Secret Passages, I have met many, 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 many participants. I have coached them and guided them to go through coherent and understanding narratives. I have created sharing circles for them to know how to relook at each other's stories as well. And also have all with the collective yarn. And they have told me that they have been able to reclaim their narrative, reframe it. Now that you know that there are perspective shifts happening over here, you know, my quest over here started growing. And being an educator, I had to empower through the stories that I tell and the stories that I pick up are from the fables and, and the traditional tales, right? So I began questioning. So I started curating stories to cure. And one of the stories that I want to share with all of you right now is the story of the fox and the grapes. Now all of you know that we have this fox who could not pluck those grapes and he gives this false, false consolation to his brain saying that the grapes are sour. Now for, to me, this is an unfinished story because he had this heart which was singing, what luscious grapes are those? Who wants to stay in that story? It's quite toxic. So in my retelling, I say that that night the fox didn't sleep and he felt very restless and his heart began singing. Next day, he wakes up and he starts upskilling himself. He practices and he's just able to taste those grapes. What luscious grapes are these? And at this point of time, his body, his heart, his head were in alignment. They were able to sing the same songs. I think that's the story that I would like to tell. What kind of stories are we telling? And you know the true meaning of life is to actually taste all kinds of grapes, be it sour or be it sweet, right? Sometimes you find the grapes that are sour also sweet. So start tasting all the grapes. Don't give up. And yes, in retrospect, if you see, uh, we had stories where villains died as villains. 
Why not have these villains also go through their heroic journey as well? And have a shift there? Why not have characters from the story who tell you that, yes, I admitted this mistake, and this is a lesson I learned. Like, uh, look at the traditional story of Cinderella, which most of you have grown up with. Now, what's happening in the story? And what if we have a story right at the beginning? Cinderella's stepmom, who is the best grandmother for Cinderella's kids, and she is going to tell the story to them. And in this story, she confides in the children about the mistakes that she did about her own insecurities. How many times, times do you really tell stories with that narrative? Or from that point of view? Imagine this world would be such a beautiful place if everyone will stand up and own up their mistakes. Yes, it's time that we reframe our stories. And we create safe space for others to share their stories as well. So now that you know that you need to start shifting your perspectives, open up these perceptions as well, the last step is action. You know, good work takes tough decisions. And good relationships have to undergo difficult conversations. And the constant working towards resolving conflicts. And many times when you are there at the center of that conflict, you'll also notice that you want to go to that time when it all began, and that's where exactly the return journey is, and that's where the full circle is. Where the story begins is where the story ends. So, my dear friends, it's time that you tell the story to yourself first. Because the moment you start telling it to yourself, you actually show hope. You show grace and you show, show shift in perceptions. So there are four tools here. One is you accept yourself in the wholeness. Second is begin visualization and add bigger details to your stories. And third is change perspectives. And fourth is action. I would love to close my story with a, uh, close my entire story of this TEDx with a short story. You see, I'm a storyteller. So I have to do this. So once there was a shepherd who climbed up the hill and he noticed a key flower. It was quite fragrant. And he walked towards a stone house with a wooden door. It was at this time he saw a key hole. And he was able to plug, put in the key flower into the keyhole and click, it opens. And inside the stone house, he saw his name, he saw his birth date, he saw his life written on it, past, future. He wanted to memorize his future, word to word, chapter to chapter. And he just couldn't do it. He failed. And right at the center of that stone house, he saw heaps of gemstones. Mm, he thought. He went and picked it up, put it inside his pocket. Another one, pocket. Another one, pocket. And he ran, he rushed, climbed down the hill. When it began raining very heavily, soaked and drenched in rain, he enters a little house. And then, he instantly puts his hand inside his pockets. To his surprise, he sees everything had turned into crushed leaves. He climbed up the hill once again. He was looking for that key flower, looking for that stone house, uh, but he just couldn't find anything. And it felt like the rain had washed away everything that had happened moments ago. And now he could feel the gasping of his breath. He could feel the thumping of his heartbeat. And in front of him, he saw the gray clouds turning into white. And he saw the sun shining bright. He took a deep breath and he told himself that the treasure lies in the now. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Gita Anjali, ma'am. What an evening that's kept us cerebrally active and thinking. So many different, sp different perspectives. So much food for thought. I would now like to request our chief guest, Shainaz ma'am, to please share her uh, uh, thoughts on this event. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. It has indeed been a productive yet enjoyable evening today. Each speaker has uh, given another dimension to our perspectives and added knowledge to our already existing repository of information. For those who are not familiar, TEDx is an acronym for technology, entertainment, and design. Today's event is a platform for not only students, but for people from diverse backgrounds, influencing the way we approach difficult or uncertain situations in a professional or mature way. We are living in a world that is constantly changing, and it is difficult to keep up with all the latest trends and development. So events like these give a platform which offers knowledge experiences, which are shared by experts and leaders from across varied industries and academic disciplines. Thank you. It also stimulates one's global citizenship, helping us to become more educated and connected than ever before. Seeing young students participate as speakers has definitely inspired and motivated so many of their peers sitting here and getting feedback from peers and mentors is as important for the young speakers who were on stage today. Now that we have diverse subjects integrated in the education system, I think this is a great platform which fosters innovation, creativity, and skill development. The Orbis School believes in similar ideologies as that of TEDx. We feel so happy to encourage this, and I'm so glad that I'm here this evening to be a part of this. I'm sure everyone here has gained immensely from this experience. The entire TEDx crew has done meticulously organized the event, and how can I forget to mention the wonderful students' performance our dear students, thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. We thank each and every one of you for being a part of this event. And above all, a huge round of applause for all the speakers who have taken time out and have enlightened us with such phenomenal ideas and words. We request our chief guest, Mrs. Shahnaz Faki, along with our directors, Mr. Razi Faki and Mr. Sharaf Faki, our guest of honor, Mr. Aman Rajabali, our director principal, Ms. Gunjan Shrivastav, principal, Ms. Farida Haryanwala, headmistress of the Orbis School Mundwa, Ms. Anju Jaswal, and headmistress of the Orbis School Keshav Nagar, Ms. Sheena Sethi, to kindly come upon the stage and felicitate our speakers.
Razi sir, we request you to felicitate Ms. Sunanda Mehta. Shahnaz Ma'am, we request you to felicitate Dr. Apoor Shimpi. We request you to felicitate Ms. Gitanjali Kaul. Sharuk sir, we request you to felicitate Ms. Deepti Sharma. Thank you sir. Gunjan ma'am, we request you to felicitate Ms. Tanya Sharma. Farida ma'am, we request you to felicitate Ms. Freya Havewala. Thank you ma'am. Anju ma'am, we request you to felicitate Ms. Anvesha Mukherjee. our guest of honor, Mr. Aman Rajabali. Sirs and ma'ams, we request all to take their seats.
is slow when you wait. Time is fast when you're late. Time is deadly when you're sad. Time is short when you're happy. Time is endless when you are in pain. Time is long when you're bored. Every time, time is determined by your feelings and your psychological conditions and not by your clocks. So have a great time always. We request all of you to join us for high tea in the lawn and enjoy the rest of the evening as much as we have enjoyed hosting this event. Thank you.